The Soldier's Tale, as told to Neil Mukherjee. What do we want from the world? It's a question that crops up again and again in my head as I process the applications and read the case files and the histories they contain. They're histories of the worst in us. Or maybe I need to refine that. They belong within a spectrum where the term worst, as a superlative form of bad, simply does not apply. An overused ordinary word such as bad or worst holds no meaning here. I leave it to you to imagine what is done to, say, two ten-year-old girls seized by a rabble of male soldiers of the Lord's Resistance Army. And this is my guess. You won't be able even to cross the threshold of the unimaginable, let alone begin to get anywhere near what actually happens. Which body parts to bend and buckle and twist, which to tear, rip, slash, gouge, which to burn with fire or acid, the creativity on this is boundless, leaving the imagination exposed as such an old-fashioned tool, an abacus in Silicon Valley. I read pages and pages of these every day, sometimes just a bare mention of an atrocity without any details is the most troubling, leaving me to imagine the lacunae, and then I do not know which is worse, the imagination succeeding or failing. But still, I read them, I have to read them, because I'm a cog in the wheel of the giant machine that determines whether these torn, branded, gassed, fleeing people can make a new life for themselves in a new country where they are safe from harm. Such a small thing to want from life, don't you think? To be safe from harm? But you learn very quickly that you have to turn down most of them. What you also learn is that gradually the human mind begins to insulate itself in the face of such evidence, or narrative, if you will, to the point that you start to protect yourself from what you read. You have to. Nice twist, isn't it? That they come to you seeking protection and you end up protecting yourself from them. There's nothing in Salim's application that is extraordinary or atrocious or eye-catching. In fact, exactly the opposite. The communist argument made is that the applicant will be killed, tortured, imprisoned if he's sent back to the place he has escaped from, and this is the centerpiece of Salim's too. He's from Asmara in Eritrea, and at the age of 17 or 18, he's forcibly conscripted by the army in 1996 and sent off to fight in the Eritrean-Ethiopian war that began in 1998. He's told by the commander in charge that his military service is going to last for a mere six months. The six months proved to be elastic. After six years of being moved from camp to camp, fighting against Ethiopia, against Djibouti, Salim summons enough courage to confront his commander about this broken promise, for which Salim is first detained, then confined in an underground prison. The prison houses nearly 400 men and 20 of them, Salim among them, dig their way to escape after one year. Soldiers fire on them and while the narrative is not forthcoming on how many the soldiers got, Salim survives and after walking for one month, he enters Sudan illegally without any papers. Salim is in Sudan for eight years and the record of his time there is sketchy, especially given the crucial things that occur a marriage to an Ethiopian woman called Abida, a Christian who works as a cleaner, the birth of a son, family trouble issuing from the fact that Abida has married not only an Eritrean, the national of an enemy state, but insult to injury, a Muslim, leading eventually to Abida returning to Ethiopia, leaving the child in care of Salim's mother, who travels to Sudan to look after him. The account of the time in Sudan is perfunctory, and skate so quickly over such important turning points that my suspicions, honed by years of home office training, cannot help but be aroused. These are the things that we have been trained to winkle out of applications and use to demolish the arguments for refugee status. The more you read, the more you notice that sometimes the arithmetic is not quite accurate. The date of birth changes, the number of years on the run or in hiding, or moving from one place to another can be variable, the accounts contradictory or inconsistent here and there, things not adding up properly. And yet, 
In Salim's application, something gets through. Sometimes, even for the hardest of apparatchiks, a detail catches hold. Whatever the reality of the matter or the accuracy of these details, two salient points emerge from the Sudan chapter. The first, Salim works illegally in the black economy in Sudan for the eight years he's there and saves enough money to pay 1,000 US dollars to a trafficker, Omar, to go to Libya, where he's promised a regular job, a better life, papers. The second, a son he leaves behind with his mother. This latter fact belongs to a category we call discretionary, the unsaid rule being that it is or should be orthogonal to any decision made about the refugees leave to remain. Salim belongs to a group of 30 men who are driven, each tied to a big truck, for four days until they arrive at a border town where they are sold to rich Libyan men. It is here that Salim realizes what the racket is, slavery. The Libyan man, Ahmad, who buys Salim, takes him to the desert to look after sheep. Salim joins a group of eight such shepherds, all of them housed in a bunker in the middle of nowhere. He works here for six months without any pay. There's nowhere to escape. He's in the middle of the Sahara. The hard calculation that leads Ahmad to return Salim to Omar, the racketeer boss, after six months, remains opaque to Salim, but when he asks Omar for money for all the labor in the desert, Ali says that there's no money for him, and if he dares to ask again, he will kill Salim himself or having, have him killed by his goons. There is nothing for it, so Salim travels to Benghazi and from here to Tripoli, where he stays for a year, working odd jobs in construction as a handyman lifting, carrying, and saves up enough money to pay a further 1600 US dollars to yet another trafficker who promises him and 84 others, 60 men and 25 women, a new life, a better life, a decent working life in the paradise across the waters that is Europe. Yet again, Salim falls for it. What can be worse than this life as an illegal low-grade laborer in an alien city? Better to cross the Mediterranean, to life in the wealthy north, the land of hope, of jobs. What do we want from the world? A point of rest, security, the tacit assurance that one will be able to live the full trajectory of one's life, from birth to death, without any shock denting or cutting short that arc. More perhaps, a home, enough to eat, freedom from illness and disease, and the capacity to get treatment from them when they afflict us. The inflatable dinghy is 11 meters long. 85 humans are packed onto it. The traffickers point out the cylinders of fuel, then pick two men to drive the boat and show them how to operate the engine and push the dinghy into the waters. It is the dead of night. A few hours into the sea, the passengers discover that the dinghy has holes in its bottom. For one day and one night, they take turns bailing water out of the boat until the engine sputters and stalls in international waters. They bob and float, bailing water on the vast open sea for four days. Then they're spotted by a Tunisian fishing trawler. The fishermen cannot repair the dinghy's bust engine, but what they are able to do is call the Italian police, who arrive in a helicopter, then a big ship, which saves all 85 of the refugees. They're taken to Lampedusa, where they're fingerprinted. This is an important moment, both an arrival and the beginning of a kind of imprisonment, but Salim doesn't know this yet. The new life is new, but not in any way he has imagined. He will find out. The new arrivals are taken to the refugee camp near Catania. Fifteen months elapse as Salim's application is processed by the Italian authorities. At the end of this period, he gets his five-year soggiorno and is released from the camp into the freedom of Italy. The new life begins. He has no money, no home, no job, no benefits, no Italian, nothing. For nine months, he sleeps on the streets, eats from garbage bins, sifts through rubbish heap for clothes, a stray dog among humans. He is sick, frequently. 
He moves from city to city, from Catania to Palermo, Rome, Messina, begging, foraging, homeless, until he fetches up at Milan and manages to board a train to Calais and join the jungle. He loses his Italian documents and phone in a jungle port and reports the fact to Calais police. For the 20 days that he is there in the jungle, he tries to jump each day onto a Eurostar on the open truck carrier of the train, headed to London. One day in July, he gets lucky. He manages to give everyone the slip, hide under a truck on the Eurostar and come to Dover. He immediately seeks asylum at the border. After two months at Dover, the Home Office decides, I mean we decide, to deport him back to Italy. Under Section 4 of the Immigration Act, he's eligible for refugee status only in the European country where he first disembarked and was fingerprinted, which is Italy, and not allowed to shop around. Salim refuses very strongly to board the flight and is taken to an immigration removal center near the airport. Every few days, the Home Office cancels and reissues tickets to Italy and he's carted off to the airport and even onto a plane. On one occasion, the pilot refuses to fly with a forcible deportation case on board his flight. In detention, Salim is visited by someone from a visitor's group. In a rare aside in the application, Salim notes, without them, I would have killed myself. They took me from dark to light. Then in accordance with new rules about moving refugee applicants to different parts of the country, Salim is relocated to Glasgow. He has to report in person to the local Home Office outpost every two weeks. At any of those visits, he is liable to be detained and removed to Italy. He is still suspended in this purgatory, waiting and hoping and dreading. One could diminish a man to nothing, to chaff, to dust with this. The only weapon you need is time. And the reason Salim doesn't want to be returned to Italy? Quite apart from the life of a street dog he had there, there is this line in his application that stands out. I cannot see the difference between Eritrea and Europe. I'm not free in any of those places. And this is what pierces through my hard shell, that line. And then those lacunae again, what do they use to bail water entering the dinghy through the holes? What do they talk about when the engine dies in the deep sea? How does he save $1,000 in eight years in Sudan, or more importantly, $1,600 in one year in Libya? How does he hear of the traffickers of a better life in Europe? Who tells him these things? Who convinces him? What goes through his head as he tries to smuggle himself into a Eurostar every day for 20 days and is caught every single time? How many attempts does he give himself? After which attempt does he think, enough, I'm never going to make it? Does his mother send him pictures of his son as he grows up? What is the one month walk from Eritrea to Sudan like? What does he eat during that time? How does he travel between towns and cities in Sudan and Libya? What is the network of people keeping him alive, allowing him a toehold in the black economy in foreign, unknown countries? Why does he say that he would rather kill himself than go back to Italy? What is it like to arrive in a new world and find it to be exactly the same in substance and soul and impossibility as the old? And then you see, once the questions press, the formal application is nothing. The story that is alive, the person that is alive in the story, lies in the answers to the hundreds of questions I want to ask at every turn. I want to know, to imagine, every single detail, from the food he eats in the shepherd's hut in the middle of the Sahara, the exact nature of what looking after sheep entails, to how much money he makes a day on average begging in the streets of Italian towns, what he and his compatriots used to dig out of the underground prison in Eritrea. 13 years in different kinds of confinement or on the run, escaping from them, trying to find some measure of freedom and failing each time with every turn of the story, a seemingly eternal repetition of the pendulum swing between hope and the crushing of that hope. Another small thing to want from life, don't you think, to be free? And yet it is everything, not only to them, but to us too, who they hope will save them. 
And what does the world want from the people in search of a point of rest? Nothing.